I am the pioneer in forensic genetic genealogy. As Ed said, I've solved the first case. I applied it to the first case in 2011. I solved the first case in 2015. It wasn't the Golden State Killer, by the way. And then I'm one of the founders of the DNA Doe Project, no longer with them, however, one of the founders. So that means that uh, we uh, were, again, pioneers with the SNP testing, the, re the current revolution. And we did a couple of solves with that even before the Golden State Killer happened. So there you go. And since then, um, you know, we, we the, the technology evolves and, you know, we get harder cases and we try to, you know, invent new ways of doing things. So in the end, we've had a number of success stories. Uh, we do more and more with less and less. So we're getting to some cases that are, you know, really tough, but yet like the boy in the box, for example, that was unbelievably hard. It took two and a half years to do the DNA on that. So that's what we did. And it was, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Wow. Great, great. So doc, let's just kick off right from the get-go and jump into this with both feet. So normally, you know, we have crime scene investigators. We go out, like, such as myself, and we collect um, possible DNA samples, whether it's blood, saliva, vaginal fluids, whatever the case may be, from our crime scenes. Um, and then we send it to the lab, and the lab typically does um, uh, a Y-DNA STR uh, workup on, on the samples. And if they yield uh, an appropriate um, profile, they'll enter it into CODIS. Now, just like in this case, um, there were multiple samples that were collected. What type <laughs> of samples they were, uh, we don't know. Whether it was blood, whether it was skin tissue, we, we don't know what it was, okay? Whether it was hair, um, uh, whatever. And so they, in this case, this horrific quadruple homicide of these innocent people in their beds, they grab the samples, send it to the Idaho lab, they work it up, put it into CODIS, nothing. So now what did they do? They reach out to someone like you? Um, yeah, um, they <clears throat> probably reached out to one of the labs. It's not really known who they are or who reached out. Probably Idaho State, State Police. I've heard it was the FBI. May have been the local police department as well. Um, I want to say that in when, and you guys know that in any kind of st stabbing death, the killer normally also cuts himself. So here you have four stabbing deaths at one time of young people fighting back. Mm -hmm. So guaranteed that whoever did this cut himself and left his own blood at the scene of the crime. Mm -hmm. There may have been other DNA there as well, you know, touch light switches, you know, the drill, yeah. uh, you know, may have you know, left an artifact of his not part of his knife. You know, who knows? We, they're not really talking. But obtaining DNA from a crime scene like that, I, my understanding is not really, my experience is not really that difficult. Mm -hmm. So after sending it to CODIS, like, you know, everybody's done for 30 years now, um, they usually, they would, uh, if they're going to pursue FGG, they're going to send it to a private lab that can generate that data, that different kind of data. It's a whole different kind of data. Mm -hmm. The crime labs don't do this kind of work. So you have to go somewhere else. And, you know, in, in CODIS language, what happens is that you get the DNA, you send it to a lab, they generate a profile, they upload to the databases, and they look for hits. And that's exactly what you do this time. You get the DNA, you send it to a lab, you generate a profile, you upload it to the databases, and you look for hits, but it's a different lab, a different profile, a different database, and a different hit. But generically, it's the same process. Doc, I know you're doing a lot of work on... Um on mixtures. Uh, are, are you have any new developments uh, uh, with that in terms of being able to separate uh, commingled DNA? Um, no, not really. Uh, it's still in progress. I mean, I, I don't have a lab, you know, I help, I work with other companies sometimes on that, mm -hmm. but right now we can do mixtures if the male or the bad guy is the major, a clear major over the good guy. Let's put mm -hmm. it that way. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we can't do three-way mixtures or complex mixtures. It's got to be a simple mixture with the bad guy, a clear major contributor. That's mm -hmm. it for now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, no, hope for the future. Oh, uh, but wait, wait, but wait, but there's wait, more. There's more. Because you can do Y DNA on mixtures. 
So know. if you have a mixture, get a wide profile done and you'll maybe you can come to me and get your get it compared to the genetic genealogy databases. You know, I'm the one that really does that analysis par excellence. So, you know, if you have a mixture you, and it's not a clear major, you know, your bad guy isn't the clear major. You can still do the wide DNA. So don't give up. All right. Sounds great. Wow. So we got a question from uh, over in the UK, it appears, with a $10 pound donation, James Elm L. Can you read that, Doc? He says, thank you very says, much. Uh, how long does a sample have to be analyzed and not degrade? Uh, why is the Y chromosome and not the X? Well, the, first of all, the Y chromosome is clean. You know, it's the male. It's the male. It's associated with the name. No ambiguity in that. The X chromosome is funny because I have two and, and the guys out there have one. So, you know, the, the inheritance pattern is kind of jigsaw, you know, like my dad has his, how does it go? My dad has one, my mom has two. So when I inherited it, I get like kind of a, I get my dad's ex and I get sort of a scrambled eggs of my mom's, you know? So, and then my brother gets only my mom's. No, yeah, only my. So it's funny, you know. It's it, it, but the Y is it like a super highway back along the male line. We've seen cases within the last couple of years that had no DNA. You know, there, for some reason the bones were out in the sun. I don't know what happened, but I've solved. You know, I was working on the Titanic baby, and that was from 2012, and that baby was exhumed in about 1998 after 80 years, 85 years or so, and they had three baby teeth. Uh, a little bit of wrist bone, and there was enough DNA left that we made that identification. And that and that grave had been in like acid rain up in Halifax. The baby had been interred. Most of the baby's remains were gone, just wow. a few tiny shards of teeth. And um, that was enough. Colleen, would, would you start off first with the SDR sample from um, the forensic lab, or would you maybe go to a snippet? Well, you know, that, that's a really good question because right now the Department of Justice interim guidelines from 2000, I think, 19 say that you have to do a CODIS STR profile first. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get any hits, then you can proceed to FGG. Mm -hmm. Now, my I think that that is going to start to change because, uh, you know, there are, are cases where you don't have an STR profile. Either the DNA has been used up or it's too little amount to get a CODIS profile. Or it's now we do the, the data from rootless hair. We do right. FGG from rootless hair. And it's not possible to have an STR profile from that now. So for those of you who don't know, can okay. you explain what FTG is? Oh, I'm sorry. That's forensic genetic genealogy. It's yeah. just rather when you say forensic genetic genealogy, you say it too many times during the day. You have to get up an hour earlier because it's so long. <laughs> you know, yes. so you say FGG and that does it. And then it's STR other, stands for. Oh, you guys were cursing, so that's why I wanted to be sure that. <laughs> oh, okay, you know. oh, darn FGG, yeah. Yeah, and and, and for, for those who don't know, SDR stands for short tandem repeats. Uh, you know, so okay, so we're talking about DNA types. Okay, continue, yeah. Doc. Well, so that's what happens. STRs are real estate. You know, right. they're like chunks of DNA. Mm -hmm. And so typically CODIS has 20 of them scattered mm -hmm. around the chromosomes. Mm -hmm. But uh, forensic genetic genealogy, FGG, uses uh, points called SNPs, mm -hmm. SNPs, abbreviation for something real complicated, SNPs. Right, single, SNPs. single nucleotide uh, polymorphism. You passed the test. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and so the S is uh, for single as points. So you have 20 CODIS markers, you're going to have 1.2 million SNPs, you know, so you have a lot you can do with that data. And that's generally what happens is they send it to the lab, <clears throat> they put it in there, they have a SNP machine, they crank, you know, and the SNPs <laughs> come out in little bowls in the other end, and then they stir them up and they do whatever they do. Supposedly, there's so much commingled blood, and look, we have four uh, victims, right? Mm -hmm. but we also have a house full of. This is like college, uh, you know, college party mm -hmm. house. You know, we 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 see video and footage from in the months leading up to this heinous crime. Uh, tons and tons of kids partying inside that house. So where everybody gets caught up, Colleen, is is that there could be so much, so many different pieces or uh, samples of DNA in that house. Uh, mm -hmm. So many people coming and going, being at a party, mm -hmm. atmosphere. 
how hard is it to sift through that and get to what you just described? Well, I'm telling you, it depends on the crime scene because the guy injured himself. I'm telling you, and that could be one piece of evidence. They found the, the guy who did it. They think they did it in Pennsylvania. Look at his hands, see if he's injured. You know, see if he cut, he has a cut somewhere, you know, and, and you can, it depends on the crime scene, because for example, if he's making a getaway, he's dripping blood down the hallway, mm-hmm. you know, and there's yeah. blood from the, the bedroom to the front door. Who would have left that? Who left right. the house that was bleeding? Right. Where are these 90 degree blood drops on the floor coming from or on top of the bedding coming from on Correct. top of the victims? Yes. We right. had this discussion. Yes. And then, um, so now. They get a court order. You mm-hmm. know, they have probable cause uh, to make an arrest and a warrant and search and seizure uh, warrants. And so they get a court order. They buccal swab them. They get that uh, Y DNA sample. And they and now they match Y DNA to Y DNA. Well, it's not Y DNA anymore. It's CODIS. Well, wow, CODIS, yes. No. Y yeah. DNA is like a more, it's a, it's an earlier form of FGG. Yeah. An earlier so I'm talking form. The, now, the, the STR you, you still use it because mm-hmm. if you have a Y profile and you don't have any more DNA to do the, you know, the SNP testing, you can punt, you know, and still do that. You know, I just saying that it, it's F, nowadays, the big cases you hear are FGG and or SNP testing and CODIS. Right. But Y DNA is still there in, in a pinch. Right. I love that you said you could still punt. That's awesome. I love the football terminology, Doc. Or Tigers. Guys, this is easy. When we talk, we have two kinds of markers we use. One of them is called STRs. The S stands for short. So an STR means you have a piece of real estate on DNA that's short and long and short and long. You know, it's got a length. Okay, when you look at SNPs, the S stands for single. So that means you got point, 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 point all over the place. So you use, when you say STR testing, you're looking at these big chunks of real estate. And generally, you don't look for many more than 20 of those chunks. When you look at the SNPs, point, 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 you're looking for 1.2 million. So SNP testing is different. You use a different machine, different software than STR testing. STR testing has been around since 30 years. SNP testing for forensics has only been around for a few years. First, I want to dispel the myth that we use Ancestry or 23andMe. That was in that news clip, and it's absolutely wrong. We do not nobody can nobody has been successful with a subpoena against ancestry or 23 and me right. somewhere on ancestry's website they are proud to list the number of subpoenas they fought off during right. the year to get their data or get into their database so right. we don't use those we use 23 and me and family tree dna only because that's the only way we can do it only two databases we are permitted to use ged yeah, G E D M A T C H. It's yeah. free. Yeah. It's free. Hey, wait, so why you got my G E D? What? No, not that G E D. No, not, no, not that one. He's the high school dropout. But anyhow, um, so yes, so what happens is like people go to 23andme and ancestry.com and they, they do their profiles in there, but they don't cross link, they don't share information. Uh, so people can take their profile from 23andMe and Ancestry.com and then go to GED or Family Tree and upload their profile into those databases. Yeah. And where the GED database tells everybody up front, hey, we share our, our database with law enforcement. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a two, two different platforms. Mm-hmm. GEDmatch was created for free, you know, to genealogists to go over. They don't do testing. All it is is a big database. Mm-hmm. And um, over time, the terms of service have changed. Mm-hmm. So if I'm a regular genealogist and I want to use it, I can go upload it for free. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can choose whether to opt in or opt out to law enforcement use. And mm-hmm. nobody sees my raw data. In fact, after I upload it, they take it away. They encrypt it or they tokenize it and it's mm-hmm. gone. Mm-hmm. So all that's really available is a list of matches. Right. And so 
you know, that's useful. And, and I can say, well, I'm okay with law enforcement seeing those or not seeing those as I see fit. Uh, Family Tree is a for-profit company that's been around for 20 years. And you are, once you are in their database, you are required to opt in. It's, it's well, you're not required. Let's say that's the default. And very mm -hmm. few people, you know, opt out because if you opt out and you don't let law enforcement use data, you have to leave the platform. You can't use any of their services. Mm -hmm. Some of the people have had their data there for 20 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty much, but yeah, that's the way it is. So those two platforms are the only ones that we can use. Okay, so get so getting back to the STR submission. So first, you have to search STR in the gene, gene, genealogy uh, database. No, no, you search SPRs in CODIS. Right. I mean, but doesn't law enforcement want you to look first in your databases with STR? No, we don't no? use STRs. We don't so you use just go right to Snippet. You get right to Snippet. Yeah, well, we have to do CODIS first with the STRs. Right. Okay, now, uh, okay, let me just say something really clear, and then I'll kind of mess it up a little bit. There's... CODIS with the STRs, Right. you do that, Interim DO, Department of Justice Guidelines. All right. No hit. Oh, my God. That's what we've been hearing about for 30 years, CODIS database. Then if that doesn't work, you go to a different lab, you generate all the SNP data, right. you get the profile, and you upload it to GEDmatch or FTDNA. They mm -hmm. don't talk to each other. Right. Okay, different. There's one little connection. And that is this. For years before, you know, maybe 2015 or 16, um, the way that genetic genealogy operated was on the basis of the Y DNA. Right. So Y DNA, we were testing. I had my brother tested for genealogy because I wanted to connect with other Fitzpatricks, mm -hmm. because Y DNA uses STRs. And the genealogy community has been using, you know, YDN STRs for a long time. So in 2011, I had the idea of getting a Y profile from a cold case using STRs, just like CODIS, though, mm -hmm. and matching that to the genetic genealogy Y DNA databases and coming up with a last name for their killers. Mm -hmm. All right. So there is one way to do genetic genealogy using STRs, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to do with CODIS. And it's, right, absolutely. And, okay, but it, you but it can't get you past, it can't get you past your parents and your siblings, right? No, why DNA, or CODIS cannot get you past yourself or your immediate relatives. Correct, that's Why DNA mm -hmm. is indicative of the male line and the family name. Right. All right, so Phoenix Canal, I took the Y DNA from the Phoenix Canal Police Department, put it in some software we designed, mm -hmm. and and tried to match the y, the Y DNA <clears throat> data from the genealogy databases from the Smith, the Jones, the Fitzpatrick's, the Polish study, whatever I could get, you mm -hmm. know, mine online, and I came up with six matches to the name Miller. So mm -hmm. I told him, I think your your guy's name Miller, but that's all I could tell him. Right. Caucasian male Miller. And that was enough for them to look in their case, their case file. They had some Millers, Brian mm -hmm. Patrick Miller. You know, that was 2000 suspects now are down to five. OK, but it didn't say who it was. It just right. gave the name. Could have been a Miller that was not in there. You right. know, you don't know, but he was. So you gave so, law enforcement the name so they could run them down. Yeah. And then whether surreptitiously or if they uh, right. obtain um, probable cause to get a warrant, they get a DNA sample uh, from mm -hmm. these suspects and then match it to what they put in CODIS. Correct. Yeah. And so that's the way it works. So there's mm -hmm. CODIS, all of CODIS stuff, and then there's all genealogy SNP testing. Mm -hmm. And the only connection is that you can do genealogy with the Y mm -hmm. STRs. But otherwise, STRs don't come into the story for genealogy. Right. If you want to get beyond the why and look mm -hmm. at you know, cousins far removed. Yeah, correct. Right. Correct. Okay. That's it. You got it. Ooh.